As season one of House of the Dragon nears its conclusion, it is abundantly evident that the first season's main goal was to advance the plot toward the inciting occurrence. We get another episode that feels every bit as long as its 67 minute runtime, packed with multiple plots, some new character development, and plenty of defining moments that could reflect the direction the show goes in season one's final two episodes. This happens as we continue the build up towards something major happening. It's hard to discuss any of that without mentioning King Visory's Targaryen who is regarded as Westeros' man with a plan. Although Viserys is the most crucial character in season 1, House of the Dragon is really an ensemble piece. With his life now in danger, it's crunch time. Characters are now setting themselves up for the struggle for the throne that will follow the king's inescapable demise. But before he leaves, let's pause to consider how excellent Paddy Considine has been in what has been a flashy and unappreciated character on House of the Dragon. Each of the three outstanding actors, Matt Smith as Demon, Olivia Cook as Alicent, and Reese Iffens as Otto, plays a character that is either somewhat insane or subtly constantly plotting. Considine portrays a morally upright, gentle, and naive character, often to his own peril. We all know Visory's end is near, and it's heartbreaking to watch him deteriorate episode after episode because it's obvious he learns from his errors and only wants to keep his home together. But this is Westeros, and these folks are con artists. So, the idea of keeping the house together is just as hopeless as the health of our beloved king. Here is what else occurred in House of the Dragon's 8th episode, The Lord of the Tides. HBO has more succession. After another time leap, we begin The Lord of the Tides, which moves us forward a few more years toward the impending civil war that will break out after King Viserys passes away. But first, another succession dispute needs to be resolved because Lord Corley's Velaryon was seriously hurt in a battle in the Stepstones. His neck was slashed, and the resulting fever seemed to be an almost insurmountable obstacle. There must be preparation and finalization of plans. In last week's episode, Corley's made it quite apparent that he wanted his grandson, Lucerys Velaryon, who is actually the son of Rhaenyra and Harwin Strong, to succeed him. Beamond, Corley's brother, isn't too keen on this, either, and insists that he should be the one to take charge while whispering the obvious, Lucerys isn't a real Velaryon. The Princess Rhaenys is split between her brother-in-law, her grandkids, and, why not, herself because she believes she has lost both of her children and will soon lose her husband. When the big guy falls, someone has to step in and take over. This contentious issue is discussed throughout the episode. Rhaenyra and her new man demon travel to King's Landing to present Lucerys' case to Alicent who is now in charge of most royal affairs with the help of her constantly cunning father. They also visit King Viserys, who is mostly bedridden, sedated on milk of the poppy, and, if we're being kind, after arguing her case to Rhaenys, the dispute finally goes before a session presided over by the Queen Alicent and the King's Hand Otto. Vemond is present to argue his case as well. Alicent and Otto will undoubtedly rule in favor of Vemond. At this point, Otto has spent decades establishing the case for his ancestors and against Rhaenyra's and isn't about to stop now. He argues that during the impending conflict, an adult should be in control of the Sea Snake's fleet, which is reasonable but also, like, fuck off, guy. When Visories enters the room, he is no longer taking his medication and is very, very unwell. Well, Rhaenyra is going to argue Lucerys' case. The chamber is astounded by his appearance as it is by how ill he is. It takes him a long time to get to the throne, weighed down by clothes and accoutrements that plainly weigh more than he does, and his decision that Driftwood is settled takes even longer. The current heir and incoming monarch is Lucerys. As Corley stated, surprise of surprises, Rhaenys is also on Rhaenyra's side. Visories stated that, the end of that, and hero's birth. Over the course of season one of House of the Dragon, Demon Targaryen has undergone a lot of development. He was practically a threat when the series initially began, and Rhaenyra's appointment as heir was mostly intended as a safety measure against the mayhem that would erupt if Demon somehow gained the throne. It's become evident that Demon has been repositioned as someone who has developed a moral compass and whose side we should be on, despite the fact that he murdered his first wife and is now married to his niece. When it became clear that Lena Velaryon, his second wife, would not survive childbirth, forcing Demon to make the same choice that Viserys did with Queen Ema, he refrained from performing a forced C-section and gave her the power to make her own decision. She regrettably opted to be killed by Vihagar, but at least she was given the option. Demon helped carry out a strategy last week that would have people believed that Rhaenyra was someone to be dreaded but in reality produced a win-win situation that allowed Lena to go to a new life with Sir Carl, potentially blossoming even more with Rhaenyra by his side. Although Demon still has his temper, he now tends to reserve it for exceptional occasions. In contrast to the first half of the series, when it was evident that his brother needed assistance climbing the steps to the Iron Throne, he was the one to assist him. It's an act of respect, not out of sympathy. Demon no longer cares about the throne. Instead, he cares that his brother be respected for the kind, kind, and regrettably naive man that he is. It is also obvious how the rest of the action will proceed when Visories rules against Vemon. 
yet it's just fascinating to see how it develops. Viserys is enraged when Beeman dares to point out the obvious, that Rhaenyra's children were born outside of marriage. Because despite being ill and wasting away, Viserys still will not tolerate any disrespect for his daughter or her family. Considine does a fantastic job portraying someone who is barely alive but still feels a great deal in this episode, and this sequence may be the highlight of it all. Veeman calls Rhaenyra a whore, but Viserys draws his knife and demands Veeman's tongue when he goes farther. The most violent and horrifyingly funny scene of the series so far is when Demon assures Veeman he can hold his tongue before slashing his skull clean in half. Now a formidable anti-hero, Demon. That is it. These children are terrible. The actors portraying the Targaryen, Valerian offspring and grandchildren change with each time leap. A Lysant being informed of a situation concerning the prince is one of the first things we hear about in the episode. At first, neither the incident nor the specific prince being discussed are clear. A few minutes later, a Lysant accuses her son Egon, now portrayed by Joe Burrow lookalike Tom Glyn Carney rather than Finn Wolfhard lookalike Ty Tennant, of forcing himself on a young servant, going full Shiv Roy fake ally victim blaming mode. But you've got to keep your reputation intact. The Hightowers haven't ceased plotting and big picture thinking. And they won't stop now. The girl is given some of the plan BT that Renaya received in a previous episode by a Lysant, and that is all there is to it. Ugh. Eamon now seems precisely like you'd imagine a wicked Targaryen of the past to look, grinning with a faintly evil face in pretty much every scene he's in while Egon is busy being a jerk and a general loser. Since claiming Behagger for himself and losing his sight, he has also developed into a great fighter, and in this scene, we see him defeating Kristen Cole as they are practicing in the courtyard. The episode ends with Eamon truly threatening his nephews, Rhaenyra's offspring, at a meal hosted by advisories in the Red Keep, so it's critical that we understand exactly how deadly he has grown to be. For a brief moment, it appeared as though blood would immediately start to pour, but Elysant manages to contain her younger kid. This occurs after Egon harasses Rhaeny's granddaughter, Ysiri's intended spouse, and a number of tongue-in-cheek toasts. The two Targaryen, Hightower lads practically go into full douche mode when Ysiris gets up and begins dancing with Helena, and it's only going to get worse. There is conflict here, and it will soon reach a boiling point. The key lesson, however, oh yeah, Egon and Eamond are terrible. Moments before a catastrophe, the interaction between erstwhile best friends Rhaenyra and Elysian, which Viserys requests at the Red Keep, is the only positive aspect of the meal. The two toast one another and appear to wish that things had turned out differently, despite the fact that they both obviously know what will happen when Viserys dies. These two were forced into a life none of them had chosen, even if they were friends and may have craved more. Everything seems like the quiet before a storm. The entire realm is aware that Viserys is in very bad shape. Nobody will be murmuring since everyone who witnessed his spectacular approach toward the throne knows. Civil conflict is imminent, and it's about to happen since at the episode's conclusion, Viserys is shown battling one more time. He informs Elicent, and not Rhaenyra, again about the Song of Ice and Fire prophecy, and the prince who was promised despite the fact that he is missing an eye and almost his entire face. Elicent hears him remark, it's you. It's unclear, though, if he is aware that he is speaking to Elicent or believes he is speaking to his daughter. We have the advantage of knowing that Viserys is not referring to one of the aforementioned individuals since we have watched Game of Thrones. If anybody is to blame, it's Jon Snow. They are unaware that it is a few hundred years away, and Elicent is unaware of that. We also don't know what the recently widowed queen is thinking about as Viserys breathes his last breath at the episode's conclusion, but we'll find out in the next two episodes, because it's conceivable that the hour for battle has come. Thanks for watching, and if you are new to channel, subscribe and click the bell for latest videos of Media Breakdown.